Hello and welcome to My Security TV. My name is Chris Coverage. I'm the director with My Security Media. Welcome to our Tuesday afternoon Tech and Sec Weekly. Uh, today we're going to be joined by Dr. Dennis Kengo Oka, Principal Automotive Security Strategist with Synopsys Software Integrity Group, looking at attacking automotive keyless entry systems. Looking forward to this one. So if you have a keyless uh, entry vehicle, uh, this is one to watch for you, but also uh, through the process of sort of red teaming uh, vehicles, uh, modern vehicles today as well for security vulnerabilities. For those who may be following us for the first time, we cover on aerospace and space, defence and national security, cybersecurity and critical technology and cities and infrastructure. We tend to go for that 45 minute to 60 minute range and we probably will today. Uh, hashtag MySecurityTV. Press like if you can. Please share us out to your colleagues. Uh, and also uh, welcome to say g'day and tell us where you're listening from. Uh, we will also release this out as a Cybersecurity Weekly podcast. Uh, and as I mentioned, we are streaming on YouTube, LinkedIn and on various Facebook channels uh, with My Security Media and the Asia Pacific Security Magazine. Just a quick catch up from Friday. We spoke to doc, doc, Dr. Jerns uh, Gunnerman, Managing Director with the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre, looking at their sort of Industry 4.0, the Smart Factory technology and a range of their different uh, projects that they have. So very interesting uh, with uh, Dr. Gunnerman. And then we were also crossed over to, he was in Atlanta, uh, but this is the state of California is commencing with virtual reality decision tactics law enforcement training. So we looked at the virtual systems uh, and in various training solutions in virtual reality for police uh, and obviously that's adapted from military but it also will have security industry uh, ramifications also. Uh, two podcasts out from Jane Lowe, our Singapore correspondent. And this one we released yesterday as part of International Women's Day, the big biz of crypto crime, the pandemic year of 2020. Uh, and we were joined by Kimberly Grayer, the head of research with Chanalis. Very insightful, looking at uh, crypto crime, uh, also money laundering on the dark net. So please check that out, episode 249 and her previous episode 248, Quantum Technology uh, with Dr. Tommaso Gigliadoni, uh, also very insightful. So uh, thank you to Jane for those. Uh, and um, also yesterday we touched in with Jane, uh, we released and opened for nominations, the top women in security ASEAN region. We did a live cross to Malaysia and uh, formally opened that. So we've had a number of nominations already. Nominations close on May 30th. So if you know women in security within the ASEAN 10 nations, uh, please reach out to them, make sure that they're nominating or go ahead and nominate them for yourself. We are being supported by RSA this year with RSA Secure ID Suite. Uh, we've also this month been supported with ALC and their live virtual training. Uh, their certified training courses for cybersecurity, everything from the CISSP through to the SABSA. Uh, see the CISA there, a proud CISA um, holder here. But uh, please check them out and they're available obviously in the ASEAN region, but also here in Australia and New Zealand. And something we're running with My Security Media and uh, Daniel Ironreich in Israel, SCADA and ICS cybersecurity courses. Uh, so this will be held over four weeks, eight sessions. Uh, please have a look at that. I've just put some uh, introductory videos on the marketplace for that. Uh, and this follows uh, two-day workshops that we held in Sydney and Perth a couple of years ago when uh, pre-COVID world. Uh, and then also, if you want to support the channel, uh, we have a range of merchandise coming out. We've created uh, initially cyber war series uh, on China, Russia and India and the APTs of the panda bear uh, and, the, and the real bear and then uh, obviously the tiger. So check them out. I'm wearing my panda bear as I do uh, currently. So that, that's it from the marketplace. Uh, without further ado, uh, we're going to be crossing over to Japan and bringing in Dr. Dennis Kengo Oka. Hopefully I'm saying that right, Dennis? Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I'm really excited to be here on the show today. Very good, thank you so much. Your Principal Automotive Security Strategist uh, with Synopsys Software Integrity Group. Maybe let's just start off with your role and your background. Pre-interview, you've been with Synopsys for about four years, but yeah, wh wh how have you got into this uh, quite an exciting and interesting field of work? Uh, yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll give a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, quick introduction to myself. Um, so at Synopsys, uh, I'm a principal automotive security strategist. 
Uh, I'm based in Tokyo, Japan, but I work uh, with our customers in the automotive industry uh, globally, uh, helping them with uh, solutions uh, to, to develop uh, secure and high quality software. And I've been involved in automotive security since uh, 2006. And it's been really amazing to see this journey the automotive industry has gone through, especially the last few years, this huge transformation uh, where a lot more focus on cybersecurity um, is happening in the industry right now. So you, are you finding you've locked in on this particular field? You've kind of, is this something you really wanted to do or you found you started off with some projects in 2006 and here you are 15 years later still in that field? It uh, must be a highly specialised field, but is that what you're finding, that it's so specialised it's, uh, it's almost difficult to leave? Um, I would say it's it's a really interesting field and it's um, changing so fast. There's always new things, new developments. If you look at a, a car from 2006 and look at a yeah. car uh, from this year or next year, it, it, it's completely different. So it's amazing to be in an industry that changes so fast and there's always new things to learn. And that's really what excites me and, and has really kept my interest to stay in this industry. Well, and the roadmap is quite exciting too in terms of autonomous vehicles uh, and basically sort of the, the service-driven uh, approach to, to driverless cars as well. Uh, it sounds like you've got your yes, career set out for you. Exactly. Very it, good. Exactly. So moving forward, it's going to be even more things happening, which is really exciting. <laughs> Mate, uh, you won't ever be out of a job. I always say that with the security industry anyway, but uh, you are in the, in the driving seat. There you go. I'll, I'll take that. Um, as I mentioned, we did episode eight. So this is going back a few years ago, 2017 at least. We interviewed uh, the White Hat hackers, Dr. Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek, uh, who were with GM's Cruise Automation. And I will put the link out uh, into the notes from that. But so we have previously, uh, even though it's been a, a little while, looked at this area in terms of red teaming and hacking into uh, a modern vehicle. You've got some slides to share. Let me bring them up and I'll get rid of mine uh, as well. Talk us through. So this is basically an analysis of an attack on automated keyless entry systems and talk us through the process, Dennis. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, uh, Chris. So uh, first, I just want to give credit to uh, Leonard Voiters at the University of Leuven in uh, Belgium who discovered this uh, vulnerability and reported it. It's a really interesting attack. So I want to go through on the next few slides how this uh, actually happened. So first, I'd like to share how the system looks like, uh, just to get an understanding of the typical use case. So on the left-hand side, we have a key fob, uh, the small device that you use to unlock your car or start the vehicle, but it also has a feature to update the key fob itself. And on the right-hand side, we have the target vehicle. Uh, within the vehicle, we have several different views. Uh, one of them is to called the BCM, the body control module. And these two devices talk to each other, the key fob and the BCM. They talk over low frequency and Bluetooth low energy. As you can see also, each of these components has a secure element, an SC, which is a hardware chip used to store cryptographic data or sensitive data, and also to perform various cryptographic operations. So from a design point of view, this looks pretty good. Uh, because you have the security uh, elements in there to help you with the uh, achieving security. All right, yep, also keep going. Oh, yep. <laughs> I want also sorry. I just want to also show you uh, to another use case, which is when you have a new key fob that you want to register to use with that vehicle. Uh, in that case, there are two steps. First, you have to provision that key fob, and then the second step is to pair that key fob. So first, I'll talk about the provisioning. And typically, the way it looks like is you have the same setup as before, the key fob on the left-hand side and the target vehicle on the right-hand side. And in the middle, you see we have a technician PC using some kind of diagnostic software communicating with a back-end HSM. And in this case, the back-end HSM would generate a signed certificate that is valid for that key fob. So you know that, that you have a valid key fob that the back-end HSM has signed. And that's part of the provisioning. The next step, which is then the pairing, you would have the same setup, except in this case, you don't need the backend HSM. You now have the key fob with that 
signed certificate, you have the technician PC with the diagnostic software, and you have the target vehicle. And the general idea here would be that when you want to pair this new key fob, you would provide this certificate to the BCM. It would then verify it to, ver to make sure that that key fob is a valid key fob that's been uh, approved by the backend HSM, so to say. So that's a typical use case that we see uh, for the key fob. And where do uh, you find most of those vulnerabilities are sitting? Is there sort of a, a, a known vulnerability sort of hotspot here in this process? Or like any other technical system, there's going to be vulnerabilities at, at each stage through that you need to, to consider? Yes, exactly. So I have summarized these uh, vulnerabilities, weaknesses on the next slide here in this table. Uh, so, so it's a great, great question, great timing. Um, and here we see the two target systems on the left-hand side, the key fob and the BCM. So starting with the key fob, as I mentioned, one of the use cases was to do an update of the key fob. And there's a vulnerability here. There's an improper signature verification of that firmware update, which allows an attacker to update a malicious firmware over BLE on the target key fob. This means that an attacker can take full control of that key fob. The second uh, issue here is on the BCM side. And as I explained on the previous slide, typically during pairing, that certificate should be sent over to the BCM. The BCM should verify it, but it's actually missing that certificate verification. And this means that an attacker can then pair a modified key fob to the target vehicle BCM. So you don't need to have that signed certificate from the back in HSM. You can just use your own modified key fob and pair it with the vehicle. So those are the two main issues in, in this current uh, system. So you don't necessarily need access to that initial key fob. You can create your own. And then with that, once you've created that certificate, any key fob can then attack any other car? Um, Yes, so so I can explain the steps here on the next slide so it's clear how uh, an attacker would perform this attack. Um, so there are a lot of arrows and, and, and uh, numbers That's here, right. but there are eight, eight steps here. So one to eight, and I'll go through them one by one. We have the same setup as before, the target key fob on the left-hand side, target vehicle with the target BCM on the right-hand side. And the attacker would have to prepare what you see in the middle, the attack device. This attack device contains three parts. One is a modified BCM, and I'll explain what the modification is uh, later on. And the second part here is a modified key fob. So both of these two, the modified key fob, modified BCM, are similar to the target BCM and the target key fob. The modification is what we have here running on the Raspberry Pi is we emulate the SC, the secure element, using software. So rather than using a uh, the hardware chip, we have that SC functionality in software. So that's the modification. So now an attacker would start going through these different steps. So if I start with step one, an attacker would physically um, walk towards the target vehicle and look through the windshield to find the VIN, the vehicle identifier number. And using this uh, VIN number, the attacker can configure this emulated BCM SC to pretend to be the target vehicle. So the attack device or the attack will move this attack device then close to the target key fob. And using this modified BCM, generate a low frequency signal pretending to be the real target vehicle and sending that signal over to the target key fob in step two. This will cause the target key fob to wake up and advertise itself as connectable. So in step three, the attacker will then connect over BLE to the target key fob, since it's now been woken up and it's addressed itself as connectable over BLE. Now the attacker has to exploit that vulnerability I mentioned before. Attacker sends a modified malicious firmware over BLE in step four and uh, overwrites the firmware on the key fob. This allows the attack to take full control of functionality in the key fob, including being, being able to execute certain commands to extract valid codes from the SC, from the secure element. 
So normally these commands would not be allowed over BLE, but using this modified firmware, attacker is now able to extract uh, valid unlock codes and, uh, 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 so for example, valid door unlock or trunk unlock code um, as part of that activity. So now uh, in step five, attack will then move back towards the target vehicle physically and over BLE, send these valid unlock codes, for example, unlocking the door. Since it's a valid unlock code coming directly from the target key fob SE, the target BCM will accept it and unlock the door. At this step, uh, step six, an attacker then has physically been able to gain access to the vehicle. The door is unlocked, I can go into the, the vehicle and I can open up the, uh, the panel underneath the instrument cluster, uh, which is or un under the, the central display, which allows me access to the diagnostics port. So that diagnostic port is connected uh, over CAN. So an attacker can now connect over CAN to the target PCM. In step seven, the attacker then uh, tells the target PCM that you want to pair a new key fob which is the modified key fob that, that the attacker has. So by sending this request to pair a new key fob, the, the weakness here that it's missing the certificate verification allows the attacker to use a modified key fob. It doesn't have the certificate, but it's possible still to pair it with the target vehicle. The target BCM now pairs this modified key fob and in step eight, the attacker can use this modified key fob with a valid uh, credential now to unlock the vehicle, to start the vehicle, and can then drive away. So that's really the, the steps that an attacker has to take, but it's fairly quick and uh, allows an attacker to extract valid information from the key target key fob and reuse it uh, on the target vehicle. Well, that's a good point. How long would this attack take? So the, the the thing that takes time is the firmware update, um, and that will take about a minute and a half. Um, but you can do that at a distance of up to 30 meters. So you just have to be in the vicinity, but it, it but not too close to be able to do that update. And this is to get entry. Is this to start the vehicle as well? Yes, exactly. So at, in step eight, once we pair our own modified key fob, we are not able to start the engine as well, and then we can drive away. So okay. uh, it allows us to really steal a vehicle. If we now through this process, I suppose I'll take one step forward on that is, was there anything else for the vehicle itself to go, hang on, this is not our normal driver. Uh, was there anything in the vehicle to say, there's another extra layer uh, of defense there, or once you'd started the car, that's it? Uh, at this point, typically, if you have a, a valid key, which in this case uh, it would be after you pair it, the vehicle will assume it's a valid key and, and let you start yeah. the vehicle. Uh, but I agree with you that you could always add additional security um, countermeasures there to detect, is this a, uh, a, a, you know, a normal time for pairing, yeah, for pairing a new key or yeah. is this activity uh, the right activity that should be happening? Um, and it also use various cameras on the vehicle to detect uh, any suspicious activity. So there are different things that could be added, uh, but this would be need to be considered how you want to use that information and how it would actually alert or um, uh, stop this from happening. Yeah, you shouldn't be getting this far in the first place. Now this was with a Tesla, right? This is August 2020, uh, and then they've released an over-the-air OTA patch to address that in November 2020. Yes, uh, exactly. So this was the Tesla Model X. And what's interesting here, as you, as you just mentioned, um, the information was provided to Tesla in August. They had you know, some time to, to fix it quickly. And because they also have this uh, OTA capability that allows them to perform an update over there, they were able to, in a very short amount of time, come up with a fix and uh, address this issue by pushing this out to the vulnerable vehicles. Very good. Now, maybe talk us through what should have been done. If we talk about security by design here, 
and it sounds like a pretty basic system, particularly when you're just using Raspberry Pi and a blue, Bluetooth. Uh, what what level, uh, in, in terms of the patch, do you know what the patch involved in terms of what they've actually fixed? Because it sounds like when you're dealing with certificates and the like, if all you need is the VIN, the vehicle identification number, you should be getting something more than that. Uh, yes, yeah, so I don't have the exact details of what was actually patched uh, when they fixed it, um, but I can talk a little bit more about, in general, um, how you should consider security for the development process. So rather than looking at one specific fix, uh, I want to take a step back and look at how would you, um, in the automotive industry, consider the different risks and threats that are out there and how would you apply the appropriate countermeasures and security solutions. So I wanted to go through a few steps here in the V model, the development uh, process that we have uh, typically used in the automotive industry. And starting from the left-hand side, we see we have security requirements review, uh, secure design review. Uh, also have a Tara here, the threat analysis and risk assessment. And early on, when you design the system or develop the requirements for that system, uh, it will be useful to understand what are the threats and what are the risks. Uh, so in the previous example, we can see that maybe it's an, uh, an attack where someone tries to update the firmware with the malicious uh, uh, firmware, or that they try to pair a, a modified key fob. Then you need to have those requirements and, and design in place that says, we need to have a certificate verification. Uh, we need to have um, uh, the, the proper requirements for detecting if there are you know, certain attacks, if, if it fails, how do we detect it and so on. And then you also need to have the, the actual implementation itself. Once you develop it, make sure that your software your implementation is correct, uh, using best practices for coding guidelines and so on, and also identifying any vulnerabilities in the third party components, open source software that you might be using. And then finally, on the right-hand side, we have the testing and validation. So you would typically use uh, various test approaches, such as fuzz testing, to help you find unknown vulnerabilities uh, in the target software, as well as penetration testing, which would be a, a black box, typically a black box type of approach where you try to attack the system, or, or use like a gray box or white box approach as well. So that would help in understanding any weaknesses, vulnerabilities in the system before release of the product. But just going back to this particular vulnerability or the the successful attack, that's almost like an access type of vulnerability, correct? It's not a it wasn't a vulnerability with a certificate or anything like that. Just the system was accessible remotely uh, with a simple VIN number. Is, is, is am I right in in that? Once you've got that VIN um, number, you're pretty much talking to the vehicle. So. If I go back to, let's see, I have this one. So the VIN number here um, is used to generate a signal, a low frequency signal to tell the target key fob that it's you know your vehicle that's asking you to wake up. So that's how the VIN number is used. Uh, because typically if you wanna open, you know, unlock your car door or you wanna start your car, uh, there's a, a pressure to be as fast as possible. You don't want the user to wait five seconds or 10 seconds for the door mm -hmm. to unlock or to start the, the vehicle. So often you would have something, um, I would say, fairly simple, such as um, some kind of signal that's based on the VIN. And this allows you to quickly say, hey, I'm your vehicle. Uh, there might be some ways to have more security here, going through some kind of handshake. But again, that would also add more time to right. uh, to the user to allow, allow them to start the vehicle. So I do have, <laughs> let me see, I just switch to this one. Uh, I do yeah. have an example where I explain uh, that this step here, the second step, as well as the first step with the VIN, that's the typical normal activity. So it would be hard to add additional security to those two points. But if we focus on steps three and four, which allowed us to update the firmware, on yeah. the key fob, uh, and this was actually a vulnerability in, so they do have signature verification, but it's uh, it's a vulnerability that allows the attacker to uh, send a malicious firmware that doesn't have a correct signature, but it will still be uh, flashed to that to the key fob. 
So this was a, a vulnerability in the implementation. And this could be found as a say here on the right-hand side, uh, using these different measures with static code analysis, software composition analysis, um, or with testing, fuzz testing, penetration testing. So that's really where one of the issues is that you want to make sure that uh, if you have a feature to allow you to update the firmware, which is good, you need to be able to do patching, you also need to make sure that that update procedure itself is secure and doesn't allow an attacker to abuse that feature. And was it Synopsys that discovered this? Was this wasn't also out as a YouTube video uh, already? Uh, and so sort of how, uh, if you if you did discover this, what was the process of doing that? Of you would have been looking at multiple potential vulnerabilities at the time. Uh, do you sequentially work through this, or do you work as a team uh, and sort of uh, red team the vehicle? What what was your process through here? Um, so, so this uh, attack and the vulnerabilities was discovered by uh, Leonard Voiters uh, at the University of Leuven in Belgium. So he he found the vulnerabilities. He designed uh, uh, this attack device and, and came up came up with this approach on how to to uh, execute the attack. And he also made a very nice uh, YouTube video where they show how they go through it. Uh, what I tried to do was to to perform an analysis of that to better understand exactly what the steps are. Uh, because the, there are some details not uh, publicly released yet, so there are some. So I, I tried to extract that information, and based on uh, my experience in industry and how these systems work, come up with this is probably uh, where the, the challenges are and, and how you can address them. Very good, and then use that as a learning opportunity for others uh, in the sector. Okay, look, very yes, good. I'll the, try to exactly. find that YouTube. I'll try to find that uh, YouTube link if you've got it. But I think the other thing that we're looking at here is a cybersecurity engineering standard called ISO SAE 21342 and the regulations, uh, UN regulation 155 for cybersecurity uh, and these cover the automotive industry. So again, this is a, uh, um, I'm trying to think which channel we put this on. I think we put it on our drastic news channel, which are our drones and robotics and autonomous systems. Uh, and uh, otherwise we would have put it on our Asia Pacific security magazine. So I do have the release here uh, and it's uh, again, as you pointed out, this is an, an analysis of, of this attack, uh, which is well worth it. So thank you. Was there any more slides, uh, Dennis, before we, we close off? Uh, I do have one more slide here. If, go for uh, it, mate. If we have time for that. <laughs> yeah, go for it. So, uh, so this goes to the second part of the attack where you connect to the vehicle. So we have steps five to eight. And similarly, steps five and eight are the normal activity of unlocking the, the, the vehicle with a valid code and starting the vehicle. So there's not much else we can do with those two steps. But steps six and seven, we have the, the weakness here of a missing certificate verif uh, verification on the target PCM. So uh, we don't really know if that was missing in the requirements or missing in the design or missing in the implementation, but we have different activities. Uh, we can do a review early on to detect that it's missing in the requirements or it's missing in the design. We can detect that there's a threat or, or a risk for this type of um, attack uh, using a Tara. And also perform pen testing to actually detect that there is a missing certificate uh, verification. So that's uh, really how, how these different types of attacks, um, how you can think about security for addressing these type of attacks before they happen. Uh, anyone interested, uh, feel free to uh, look at this blog as well where I explain a bit more in detail uh, the different steps that I talked about uh, or feel free to contact me. Uh, the email address is in the top right corner. So Beautiful. thank you very much, Chris, for the time. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dennis. And I mentioned uh, we have that blog on our channels too. So uh, we've already put that out, but I'll, um, I'll make a note of that. Well, it's on the video anyway, in terms of the recording. Uh, so that's the synopsis.com blogs software security key fob hack analysis. Very interesting. Um, I, I don't have one. I'm actually hanging on to my uh, Toyota for as long as I can until the driverless cars comes out. Uh, I'm just going to try and be as stubborn as I can and keep it serviced as we go. Uh, what's what's the roadmap, do you think, for the fully ad uh, autonomous vehicles coming out? Dennis, what's your uh, roadmap um, suggest? Yes, so we definitely see that direction happening now with the uh, autonomous driving, uh, connected vehicles, and I think it's going to be stepwise. We're going to see some vehicles come out. We're still going to have our manually driven cars, so to say, 
Um, and there's going to be an overlap period of time where we're going to have both autonomous and manual driving cars. Um, and then gradually, we'll probably see that phasing out. Uh, but, but it's going to be very interesting to see how we can utilize this, these new technologies and really benefit as a society uh, from these, these new technologies. So I'm really excited to see how the industry pans out. Very good. Well, we certainly need people like you there checking out, at least doing the analysis. If someone else at least finds uh, a vulnerability and reports that uh, it's understanding and sharing that knowledge out, which is very, very important. So Dr. Dennis Kengo Oka there in Japan. I'll take it you're Tokyo based. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris, for the time very today. Good. Really appreciate it. Pleasure, mate. All the best from Synopsis Software Integrity Group. Um, okay, I'll let you go. I'm going to put you backstage. Uh, all the best, Dennis. Right. Appreciate it. Right. Ciao.